Someone wrote, "'Twas the night before Jesus came, and all through the house, not a creature was praying, not one in the house. Their Bibles were laying on the shelves without care and hopes that Jesus would not come there. The children were dressing to crawl into bed, not once ever kneeling or bowing ahead. And mom in a rocker with babe on her lap was watching the late show as I took my nap. When out of the east there arose such a clatter, I sprang to my feet to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, I threw up the sash. When what to my wandering eyes should appear but angels proclaiming that Jesus was here with a light like the sun sending forth a bright ray, I knew in a moment this must be the day. The light of his face made me cover my head. It was Jesus returning just like he said. And though I possessed worldly wisdom and wealth, I cried when I saw him in spite of myself. In the book of life which he held in his hand was written the name of every saved man. He spoke not a word as he searched for my name. When he said, it's not here, my head hung in shame. The people whose names had been written with love, he gathered to take to the Father above. With those who were ready, he rose without sound, while all the rest were left standing round. I fell to my knees, but it was too late. I had waited too long. I had sealed my fate. I stood and I cried as they rose out of sight. Oh, if only, oh, if only I had been ready tonight. In the words of this poem, the meaning is clear. The coming of Jesus is drawing near. There's only one life, and when comes the last call, we'll find that the Bible was true after all. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father God, as we pause this morning, as we listen to those words, Father, as they resound with the many who will not have responded to the gospel. God, I pray this morning that the sobering fact of why you came would be indelibly imprinted upon our hearts and upon our minds as we try to share the good news of the Christ of Christmas that we sing about each and every week of our lives. Father, speak to our hearts today, I pray, in Christ's precious name, amen. This morning, from the splendor of heaven to the womb of a woman to a manger and a birth in Bethlehem. This morning, have you ever wondered, have you ever just contemplated, have you ever just thought uh, as you were thinking about questions that you have in mind. Have you ever wondered what Jesus was thinking as he left the splendor of heaven for the womb of a woman to be born down there in a stable in Bethlehem? Wouldn't you love to know what Jesus' last words to the Father was before that first Christmas Day. Well, I have some good news for you and me this this morning because the Bible allows you and me to eavesdrop in on a conversation between uh, the Father, eternal God, and the eternal Son as Jesus is stepping out of the ivory palaces of heaven's glory into the stage of world human history. The passage that 
I'm using this morning is monumental in sharing the words as spoken from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 7. Scripture says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Here's the way one translation translates those same verses. For it is not possible for the blood of bull and goats to take away sins. That's why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I've come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the Scriptures. Notice in verse 5 the important words, when Christ came into the world, it can be translated as Christ came into the world. It's as if the curtain of the original Christmas pageant was about to raise and we were privileged to hear the final goodbye that was shared by God the Son with God the Father. But because these words are permanently recorded in the Bible, we know they were never meant to be private words because Jesus' words were addressed to the Father, but they were intended for the entire world to know about. On that first Christmas, Jesus was thinking and talking about the purpose for which he was leaving heaven's glory to come to this earth. And he revealed why his birth on this earth was necessary. Let me give you three reasons before Christmas on this coming Friday. The reason he was speaking to the Father about the blood of, bu uh, of bulls and goats and not being sufficient to take away sin. Three reasons as he was speaking why he would come to the earth. Number one, his birth was necessary because a price needed to be paid. His birth was necessary because a price needed to be paid paid. Verse 4 through 6 says, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And that's why, young people, when Christ came to the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you've given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. God told Adam and Eve that sin carries a big price tag. In fact, the payment for the penalty of sin would be death. And as he exits, headed to earth from heaven, Jesus is repeating God's demand. He says the blood of animals is never what you wanted. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is because it cannot satisfy the sin debt. The blood of bulls and goats could not pay the debt in full. It wasn't sufficient. It wasn't enough. The blood of an animal might cover the sin, but it could never cleanse from sin. You and I live in a time that's very interesting in world history. We live in a time today where people don't want to hear about the blood of Jesus. As some would say, they don't want to hear of a bloody religion. But I want you to know the wonderful old song, What Can Wash Away My Sin, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. What 
can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, young people, the blood of Jesus covers our sins and it removes our sin altogether. That's why we read in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The writer of the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 said, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Let me tell you, those Old Testament priests, they spent their days in a constant routine of sacrificing and offering, and one after another, morning, noon, night, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, Year after year, decade after decade, century after century, they offered up the blood of those animal sacrifices. It could only remind them of their sin. It could not cleanse them and pardon them of their sin. And in the 1,500 years, from the time of Moses until Jesus came, Hundreds of thousands of lambs, goats, and bulls. Those were offered on the altar before God to make atonement for the sins of the people. But how many sins could all of that blood from all of those animals take away? It could not take away even one. Jesus said, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see, all of the blood of those animals did, reminded Israel that there was sin in their life and that it could not be removed by the blood of those animals. Jesus came to do what the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament could never do. He came to deal with our sin. Jesus came to pay the sin debt. You see, God's will for men, in order to be made holy, would take the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. In the old Baptist hymnal, there's a song that we used to sing. It's a song that says it so well, free from the law. Oh, happy condition, Jesus hath bled, and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace hath redeemed us once for all. Now we are free, there's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. Come unto me, oh, hear his sweet call, come, and he saves us once for all. Children of God, oh, glorious calling, surely his grace will keep us from falling, passing from death to life at his call, blessed salvation once for all. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Once for all, O brother, believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. And young people, one of the things that we as Southern Baptists believe the Bible teaches is that we are once saved, and if we're truly saved, we're saved once and once only. Let me tell you, when Jesus died on the cross, and he spoke those words on the cross, te telestai, which is, it is finished. He only came once to die once, to rise once, 
and he's not coming back to do it again. And that's the reason, young people, why I love some of these wonderful old hymns of my childhood faith is because of the doctrinal teachings of the security of the believer that once you're saved, if you really got saved, you're saved forevermore. Does that mean I'll never sin? No. You still live in an imperfect body. But we're to strive to do our best not to sin. But we know as long as we're in this world, we may be saved, but we're not safe. We're not safe till we get home. But when we get home, we're safe forevermore. I don't know about you, but that gives me incredible peace in my heart that I know, like the psalmist said, he... Jesus remembers my frame, and he knows I'm dust. I don't know about you, but it gives me great peace to know that I'm saved. I'm free from the law. His grace keeps me from falling. And you see, the reason God needed a body is because the punishment had to fit the crime. If a murderer is sentenced to just a couple of months In time out, you and I would say that is not justice. You see, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. God said the punishment for sinning and rebellion against an eternal holy God, the punishment is eternal death. Human sin demanded a a human sacrifice, and that's why God's justice Demands God demanded the human sacrifice. It would be God himself would wrap himself in human flesh and come to the earth. Young people, that's what we call the doctrine. The word doctrine just means a teaching. That's what we refer to as Southern Baptists about the doctrine of the incarnation. Incarnate Christ, God coming, being human flesh, the incarnation of Christ. And so God's justice demanded there be a human body for this sacrifice. You and I owed a debt we could never pay. Jesus came out of heaven's glory, God, to pay the debt that he did not owe. And that's why when you and I celebrate Christmas, we must celebrate the gospel. Because without the gospel, Christmas does not make sense. And without Christmas, the gospel is incomplete. That manger Jesus laid in makes no difference without the cross on Golgotha's hill where Jesus would die for Christmas to be complete, we have to celebrate the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, those shepherds were the first to hear the announcement of Jesus' birth. They're out in the fields. They're keeping their watch over their flock. And for those of you that were in Sunday school this morning or listened to Sunday school, uh, please just... uh, Excuse the reiteration this morning, but it so bears repeating to those that did not hear this. Young people, did you realize that 800 years before Jesus ever came, it was prophesied in the Old Testament, in the book of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, that Jesus was coming to the earth to be born in a place called Bethlehem. Young people, did you know that it's no accident that in Bethlehem, where Jesus was going to be born, there were those shepherds that were out there tending over their flock. Did you know those shepherds in New Testament times? It wasn't true so much in Old Testament times because Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, those Old Testament characters were looked upon with favor and renown. But in the New Testament, by that time, Some 2,000 years ago, shepherds were considered to be outcasts in society. They were socially somewhat isolated from people. They were 
pretty much uneducated. They were pretty much unskilled. They, many of them, were considered to be dishonest. Um, and so they were looked upon as outcasts. But did you know who God dispatched an angel to announce the birth of Jesus to first? Other than Mary and Joseph would be those shepherds out there in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. I mean, when he sent the angel to them, did you realize that out there in Bethlehem there were a certain breed of lambs that were bred? And when they were born, they put them in tight claws that they wrapped those little baby lambs up in. You know why they wrap those little baby lambs up in claws? Because these particular lambs were the lambs that would be used by the priest to use the blood of those little lambs to atone for the sins of the people. And they wrapped them in those claws so that before they could inspect those little lambs, to see if they had any spot or blemishes or any scarring on them or whatever, they would put them in those swaddling cloths before they could inspect them so they wouldn't hurt themselves because if they had blemishes on them, then they could not be used to atone for the sins of the people. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, the Lamb, of God would be born in the same place. He would be wrapped in swaddling clothes and those shepherds would understand he was no ordinary little child. That if he were wrapped in those swaddling clothes, he must be of a different kind. Isn't it interesting that it would be down in a place called Bethlehem that those shepherds would be watching over their flocks and all of a sudden out in the open where God had flung those stars in the heaven upon nothing that God himself invaded planet earth in human flesh and all of a sudden an angel appeared and told those shepherds this will be the sign you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. The shepherds got it. They understood it because they would wrap those little born animals, those little lambs in those kind of clothes to make sure that they were spotless before they could use their blood to atone for the sins of the people. Those shepherds that were supposedly unlearned, ignorant, it would be they that God would choose to reveal first about where they would find the Christ child. Let me tell you, the reason that Jesus came at Christmas, number one, his birth was necessary because a price needed to be paid. Secondly, he came. His birth was necessary because a promise needed to be kept. Look in our text in Hebrews 10, verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come, and the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. It's absolutely amazing. When you and I consider that 224 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled by the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Let me just give you a few. Let me tell you, hundreds of years, young people, hundreds of years before Jesus ever came, these prophecies were prophesied. Let me tell you, they were fulfilled that the Messiah was going to be born of a woman, and Jesus was. 
that the Messiah would be in the family line of Abraham and David and Jesus was. That the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem and Jesus was. That the Messiah would be born of a virgin and Jesus was. That the Messiah would spend time in Egypt and Jesus did. Remember when Mary and Joseph took him there for fear for his life? That the Messiah would be rejected by his own Jewish people, and Jesus was. That the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and Jesus was betrayed by his so-called friend, Judas Iscariot. That the Messiah would be spat on and struck and beaten, and Jesus was at the cross. And that the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced and Jesus' were. That the Messiah would be crucified with criminals and Jesus was. And the prophecy that the Messiah would conquer death and rise from the dead. And Jesus did. And that's just a few of the 224 Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled by the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every prophecy of God was a promise from God that he knows us, that he loves us, that he's always had a perfect plan to save us. And Jesus before that first Christmas in heaven, said to the Father, I'm ready to fulfill all the promises we've made to redeem the people that we love. And Jesus wasn't forced to come for us. Young people, Jesus came because he wanted to. You see, that's the wonder. That's the beauty of Christmas. Jesus was born so that you and I could be born again. Jesus became the son of man that you and I might become the sons of God. Jesus died for sin that we might die to sin. God became what we are that we someday can be like him and be with him for eternity. Well, before God left heaven, to come to earth wrapped in human flesh as Jesus. He came because his birth was necessary, because a price needed to be paid. Secondly, he came because it was necessary that a promise needed to be kept. And third and lastly, he came, his birth was necessary because a purpose needed to be fulfilled. Verse 7, behold, I've come to do your will, O God. Did you know many people all over the world this morning and throughout the ages have never found their reason and purpose for living? Did you realize there's people this morning, they are lost, they're floundering around in the highways and the byways of life. They've never found their purpose. They've never found their reason for living. And Jesus came into the world. He knew his very purpose from the beginning. He's the only baby that I know of that was ever born that knew his purpose before he came, and when he came and was born, Jesus was not pressured. He was not persuaded to give his life in place of ours. That's the reason he came. And no other baby that has ever been born knew his purpose and reason. But let me tell you, Jesus did. Jesus said, I've come, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Let me ask each of us here a question this morning. Are you a server? Are you a servee? Do you live to serve others? Or do you live to be served? Let me tell you, when Jesus was lying as a crying little baby, and as he was hung on a cross as a dying man at age 33, don't you think 
that the devil looked at him and thought how pathetic, how vulnerable. Don't you know Satan was gleeful? Gleeful when he heard the baby's cry, when he heard him saying on the cross, let me tell you, don't you know Satan was delighted? But let me tell you, looks are deceptive. Let me give you an illustration of that as I close. Looks can be so deceptive. There was a little 10-year-old boy from Hawaii. Young people, he had been in a tragic accident and he lost his left arm. But after he recovered, which surprised his parents, he came to them one day and he said, Mom and Dad, I want to learn the art of judo. At first, they were absolutely confused. They thought, what on earth is he thinking? Well, they agreed to it. And at the beginning of his very first lesson, the judo instructor said, after they had gone through all of the days of his judo schooling and preparation, his judo instructor said to the 10-year-old one day, I've got one more move I want you to learn. And I want you to really focus on this. And for months and months and months, the young man without the left arm, he practiced with his instructor exclusively. And over and over, day after day, and with the monotony of all of it, the young man went on. And he finally got that move down very skillfully. So his instructor said to him, I think it's time that you enter the competition now. The 10-year-old looked at his instructor and said, are you crazy? What on earth are you thinking about? What can I do with only one arm? I'd get creamed. But the judo instructor said, well, let's enter the competition. And let's just see what happens. So that 10-year-old boy, he entered the judo tournament. And of course, you know the ending of the story or I wouldn't tell it. He won first place. He defeated everyone in his age division. Young people, this is a true story. Afterwards, the boy said to his teacher, how on earth did I win that competition? How did I do that with only one move and no left arm? The instructor looked at him and said, son, that's easy. The move that I had you to work on over and over and over until you mastered it is one of the hardest in all of judo and the only defense against that move required your opponent to grab your left arm. Folks, I want you to know looks can be deceiving to our enemy the devil, the accuser. Every one of us must look like a one-armed kid in a karate contest. But I want you to know, as born again children of God, we have a move that is undefeatable and which makes each one of us unbeatable. And it's believing God, believing that that first Christmas, that the greatest gift of all was when he gave Jesus. He doesn't come wrapped up in paper with a fancy ribbon, but he came wrapped up in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. 33 years later, after he lived a perfect life, proving his divinity, that little lamb Jesus was sacrificed on behalf of you and me. And three days later, he arose victoriously, triumphantly over death, hell, and the grave. And by faith, and by faith, you and I can look to him and believe in him and surrender to him. We may look like a one-armed kid in a karate fight in this world and to the devil, but I want you to know looks are deceptive. 
When we are weak, he is strong. And on that Christmas 2,000 years ago, Jesus was coming to live the life that you and I could never live, to die the death that you and I could never overcome, to pay the price that you and I could never afford, and to defeat our enemy, the devil, that you and I could have never defeated, so that you and I could enjoy eternity. We'll never regret that we belong to the Savior that we'll never, ever do without. What was Jesus thinking about 2,000 years ago when he left heaven to come to earth that first Christmas? Let me tell you, young people, he was talking to his father about the greatest gift of all, and that was to come and shed his blood and to rise from the dead so that you and I could have eternal life. Do you have that assurance this morning? Do you know? Do you know that you know that you know that you know that you've been saved once for all? He gave the greatest gift of all when he gave you and me eternal life. And that's why he came at Christmas. Would you stand as we pray together? Father God, as we pause this morning, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you, oh God, that once we get you, oh God, we've got you for all eternity. And once we get to heaven, God, we're safe. We're safe from anything that could ultimately attack us in this life and destroy us and destroy our witness and our testimony. And God, there have been many, many people that have lived life and their testimony has been weakened and destroyed. But oh God, when we strive to do our best and then Father, when we walk into those pearly gates of heaven. We are alive. We are safe forevermore. Thank you for the hope of the wonderful Christmas story and the Easter story of resurrection and for the wonderful story that you're coming again to receive us unto yourself that where you are, there we can be also. God, if there's somebody out there today that has never trusted you, may they just call upon you today and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I'm that sinner that you came out of heaven's glory at Christmas for, that you went to the cross and shed your blood to cover my sins, and that you arose on that first Sunday morning so that I could have eternal life. Oh, God, forgive my sins. Come in my heart and life this day and live in me. I pray that somewhere out there, someone has prayed this prayer. If you have, get into a church, be baptized as the first step of obedience and serve the Lord all the days of your life. Father, if there's someone here in the sanctuary this morning that needs a church home or needs to come and give Jesus their heart, may they come as we sing in Christ's name. Amen.